I'm Patrick Moore. I'm Marlisa McLaughlin. Welcome to Health Buzz. Perspectives on natural health and healing. Well, Marlisa, I have a question for you. Mm, go ahead. How well did you sleep last night? I happen to sleep very well, but that's a really good question because today's show is all about sleeping. Absolutely. Sleeping, it's something that we spend one third of our lives in bed. One third of our lives, can you imagine that? We kind of just take it for granted. But what is sleeping anyway? Why are we so, why is it so important? Well, it is a function that we need to survive. It's going to rejuvenate and completely um, revamp our whole biological system. It gives us rest. But studies show that about one third of America are having trouble sleeping. And after age 65, it goes up to 50%. It's amazing. So it is a challenge out there, right? It's a huge challenge. I actually hear that more and more every day across the board from early youth to the elderly community that people are really struggling with sleep. So yeah, we, we take it for granted. We do take it for granted. And we go to our doctors or naturopath nutritionists like myself. We look at diet. We look at are you exercising? Are you taking the right foods, the right vitamins? Are you doing your checkups? But how often do we ask about sleep? That's right. I've done many food diaries in the past, but I've never asked anyone to do a sleep diary. Yet it's such a crucial component of our health. It is crucial, and it, it's just such a matter of fact that we do go to sleep every night. So I think just like stress, we know what it is, but we really don't ask ourselves, what is it really? Yes, and you know, we say, we meet people and we say, how was your day? How are you? How are you doing? Perhaps we should change it to how was your sleep? I love that. I love that. What will we do in the evening instead of saying... Sleep well. Yeah, instead of saying have a nice evening, maybe have a good sleep. And it really does have a profound effect um, on, on you because I, my sister actually, I had said to her sleep well one night on a phone call and the next morning she woke mm -hmm. up and she said, that really made me feel comforted that you said sleep well because I had actually not really thought of it like that as a greeting or a goodbye. Marlisa, do you think Ponce de Leon, searching for the fountain of youth, was just looking for a good night's sleep? Oh, gosh. Maybe, he, maybe that's it. <laughs> that is. Right? That Where everything happens. Yeah. So uh, what actually is sleep? I mean, it's a crucial biological function of our survival, basically, right? Yeah. And, you know, as a matter of fact, how would you rate your sleep? One through ten, being ten being really good. And an audience, how would you rate your sleep? Just stop for a moment. That's a great question, Marlisa. I guess we don't think about that very often, do we? But I have to say that if I had rated my sleep before this show, since we've done a lot of research on the show, that's okay, Frank. I would rate it a six. Before Rarely the show. Before the show. With some of the tips and techniques we're going to talk about, it's improved. I'm using some of the tips and, tips and techniques that we're going to discuss with the audience. And it's up to an eight now. So. Oh, that's great. Now, I know you are highly rated, right? <laughs> no, I actually, I get a really good night's sleep, and that's one of the things that my natural rhythm is pretty, has aligned with everything, even when I'm sort of interrupted with sleep shifts. But, but after we started to prepare for the show, just the appreciation for knowing all about sleep, the depths, and knowing how people struggle and everything, I actually, I'm excited about sleep. I, I feel better about sleeping, and I'm sleeping better as a result. That's outstanding. I mean, <laughs> I think about we have one trillion cells in our body, right? Yeah. One trillion cells. That's amazing. Who are working hard for us. They're toiling. They're employees for us, keeping us well during the day, physically, mentally, taking care of us in the evening. Do we ever give them a break or think about, we think about ourselves, we've got to rest ourselves, but we think of those cells as another part of our being, almost spiritually, that we need to s slow down. Give them some time. Give them some real, let them get some relaxation. <laughs> Your cells Not just you sleep. or me. Right, the sleeping cells. Get those cells relaxed. And it's a, a, it's a key to happiness, isn't it, sleep, really? Sleep could be the key to happiness. When we think of all the depression, people on medications, drugs, anxiety, and things like that, how are they sleeping? And if they're not sleeping well, what are the consequences of that? And what can we share with our audience today that can improve that aspect? Because we have to look at sleep as medicine. That's right. Especially since we spend one third of our life sleeping. Approximately. Trying to. <laughs> some less, some more, and things like that. I mean, you know, and that's a good point, Patrick, and we wanted to bring that up that 
that everybody is different and we also mm -hmm. have different sleep needs as we age from you know childhood on so um, we have an infographic for you to show you ages and sort of the common general guidelines for what the sleep hours are so newborn to three months 14 to 17 hours for lucky parents mm. yeah, I think the, the key on this for most of our audience is probably 25 plus so it's seven to nine hours so rate yourself everyone that's just for the general you know that's a generalization but seven to nine hours is regarded as the, the best amount for proper restoration regeneration of our bodies recharging your batteries exactly your mental batteries your physical batteries the regeneration of cells um, so let's talk just briefly about some of the benefits like we've just mentioned there are some more I mean there are endless amounts of benefits for sleep but you mentioned regeneration yeah we have to allow our cells to relax and our, our physical and mental batteries I mean what did Ben Franklin say early to bed early to rise makes a man and a woman today <laughs> <laughs> that's right healthy wealthy and wise so uh, it affects know, everything it affects everything my goodness if you don't have what happens how do you feel when you don't have a good night's sleep yeah grumpy my mood changes I'm sluggish well you, you know irritability and you're craving something and you I, I don't know about you but I often will go to food like oh I must be hungry or thirsty or I need caffeine because I'm sluggish but I still don't say well now I do <laughs> but that it's sleep that we're lacking or and the quality and, of your sleep and as it well. disrupts our neurotransmitters particularly serotonin so that affects it so we're craving for those carbohydrates and we might overeat on the junk food and things like that to medicate ourselves so but weight if, weight loss weight loss it affects weight loss if, think about children learning we live in an electronic stage today where I didn't grow up with that in <laughs> my generation. Right. But everybody, and I have students in my uh, classes I teach, high school students, and they're up late at night on their phones, on their laptops, on their doing videos and things like that, and all that clutter. They come into school the next day, and some of them fall asleep. Oh, it's no wonder. I mean, you think about all the data we have now in today's world, and it's just constant. It, there's just a barrage. You just don't get a break from it, really. And your brain needs time, your whole body needs time to just rest with that and integrate all of this. And you can't even integrate what you've learned so it affects your memory. Um, it, it's going to affect your mood, as we talked about, your ability to learn. Decision making. Decision making, that's huge. Absolutely. It's totally your huge. Judgment. Yes. Uh, your immune system. My goodness, you know, lack of sleep really depresses the immune system and causes almost inflammatory conditions within your body so you know you were saying before the key to happiness is a good night's sleep <laughs> sometimes that's the answer well and yeah and there's a great quote too um, a good night's sleep is the bridge between despair and hope yes it's very powerful yes um, and and when I read that I was really thinking about how true that was that it is really truly a bridge and it's the bridge between your subconscious and your conscious mind so that makes so much sense that when you're awake and alert and you're really trying to manage life and you're poorly slept the decision making can lead to a sense of despair but then you rest like yes. you say I sleep on it right yes. I'm gonna go home and sleep on it and yes. yeah Joseph Kosman the best bridge between despair and hope is a good night's sleep and it's so true isn't it it is and again the purpose of our show is that we take it for granted one-third of our lifetime think of that that our whole lifespan is going to be spent sleeping 30 years if you get to be 90 yes that's like 30 years in can bed. you imagine <laughs> if you're not sleeping well for 30 years so the quality of our life and sometimes the success of our life may depend on how we approach sleep and how we look at it and appreciate it and how important it is and what are the consequences if we're not getting a good night's sleep so what are the consequences of a bad night's sleep well we didn't talk about heart health I mean high blood pressure number one like that's right off the bat you could almost say every illness every disease can be affected by a bad night's sleep and a chronic particularly if it's chronic yes that's a key listen word. if you're a, a, a new mother and father and you've got a child I mean you know what there isn't any sleep right you're up all the time but you can do that for a while you can go through those phases but as we go on in life 
it becomes more critical and important to our health. Absolutely. So, and, you know, we, we didn't mention yet, and just to bring it up briefly, there's the circadian rhythm that has changed so much since the evolution of man, really. We had the circadian rhythm is of how your internal body works according to the outside stimulants, mo mainly light and temperature. And so when all of these things change and you think about how much pollu light pollution we have and how much stimulant we have that way, our bodies are off and they might not be mm -hmm. as the study was with people in caves that actually were deprived of light and got to find their own rhythms. It really shifts. Exactly. So that exactly. has a lot to do with it too. Now the farmers were out there using the moon and now we've got lights and you know all of these things and, change. And, and night shift workers. Night shift I mean, back workers. Back in the caveman days, I guess you may not have had night shifts. Cave person. <laughs> Or assembly lines. Right. Maybe you had a guard outside the cave, <laughs> possibly, but it's completely different in this technological society that we're living in today. So many shifts, and we exactly. really need to adjust. Um, bad night, you have some great studies. Want to share? Great yeah, studies the, on bad nights. One sleep. of the studies, the United Kingdom took about 800 civil servants and they measured their sleep habits for five years. And they found that those who got less than five hours or less increased their risk of serious disease by 30%. That's five hours or less sleep. Yes, and we're talking about cancer, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, all kinds of different disease, chronic diseases. And those are visible diseases. Then there's the invisible disease of depression and mood disorder and loneliness, isolation, all of those other things that contribute. Now that 30% increased to 40% when you looked at people 70 years or older. 70 years or older it increased 40%, which is dramatic. That is dramatic, especially knowing that our sleep needs will change and they also shift according to our age. So we're naturally in elder years the sleep patterns are very yeah, different. Yeah, because, you know, think about it. We go for our lab tests. We see our doctors. How's your cholesterol? How's your blood pressure? Do you have any pains or aches or things like that? How often have you been asked, how's your sleep? What's your sleep quotient? How many hours of sleep are you getting? Are they deep sleep? Is it restful sleep? And are what can we do about it? And what can we do about it? That's Exactly. Key. So it's rarely asked. We, again, we take it for granted. A couple other st studies, I mean, it's been estimated that car accidents, car accidents, lack of sleep attributes, I think it's 200 to 400,000 yeah, that's right. accidents. Amazing. Uh, incredible. 200 to 400,000 accidents in America are attributed to lack of sleep. There's another study, rats, of course. They always study rats. <laughs> but rats live about two to three years on average. The experiment was to deprive them of sleep. When they deprived them of sleep, they died in five weeks. It shattered their immune function. That's completely. profound. It really is, and you think about it. Absolutely. So lack of sleep is very immunosuppressive, you know, for, for all species. It affects uric acid production, too, you were talking about. Yes, lack of sleep. We came across a study where it definitely promoted uh, uric acid, which can promote gout, but uric acid through the body can, is terribly inflammatory. So it can set off a cascade of illnesses and diseases. So you've got to be very careful with that. It also affects your hormonal levels. There are studies have shown it can decrease, guys, listen to this, <laughs> decrease a man's testosterone. And of course, what all the movie stars flock to is get their human growth hormone. It can decrease your human growth hormone, which people regard as your youth hormone. So many different things to be concerned about a bad night's sleep. Besides the fact that, you know, you're talking about anxiety, depression. I mean, how many, our country right, right now, we've got kids on Ritalin, Adderall. Are they getting a good night's sleep? Are their minds filtered with too much information from the technology and phones and video games and things like that? And you know, stimulant over dopamine, drinks. Over dopamine in the brain. You know, could we get, uh, eliminate all these antidepressants if we just, a good night's sleep could be the best antidepressant in many cases? Because you said before, key to happiness, right? Right. Potentially. But you also have to think about um, not only just removing things, but what you can add. And some of the things that you remove, you have to be like just selective because everyone's different. And as, as we talked about, some yeah. people can't, let's talk about that with exercise. Some people can't get to 
their exercise until right before bed. So are we going to discuss the tips and techniques and suggestions? Yeah. Okay, so, Why don't for we do that? so exercise, yes. Exercise is great for you. You want to exercise. Some people can't, you know, studies are all over the place. Most people say don't exercise an hour and a half before you go to bed because your body's all revved up, energetic, and your pulse and things like that. But some people have no choice. This so it's true. better to exercise, obviously, at least a couple hours before you get ready for bedtime, but exercise no matter what, because it's that crucial and that's important. How often do you hear people say, I don't have time? <laughs> <laughs> often. <laughs> There's always time if you make it a priority. So that's really crucial. But just for most people, try to keep exercise an hour and a half to two hours before you're actually hitting bedside. That's right. And, and let's talk about sleep environment. Yes. Bef where you're actually sleeping as the foundation. A health, healthful, helpful, but also healthful sleep environment. Yes. You declutter your bedroom. You declutter. There was a time that I had to-do notes in my, in my bedroom. I had books, workbook, and things like that. And so it, it, it wasn't a sanctuary. It wasn't a healthful environment. What, right. would a, what would a good, I mean, you're really perfect at this. What would a good uncluttered environment look like if you're making your bedroom a sanctuary? I completely strip down everything to just a basic good mattress, good pillows, and bedding. I love having a down comforter. The yeah. weight of that, the, like weight blankets are also very good. Yeah. And the t so your temperature needs to be good. Yeah, that's a really crucial point about temperature in a, a bedroom. The range from the studies show from 60 to 68 with 65 degrees being ideal because you want to bring your core temperature down, which helps your body, your brain go into a deep sleep slumber when your temperature's down. Have you ever tried to sleep in a hot room, humid? Can't. Yeah, it's I mean, really hard to do. Yeah. Um, also, keeping the, I like to have my windows cracked if it's so possible. Um, especially burning a wood stove, I'm able to be free of thinking I'm burning up all the um, electricity yeah. because that fresh air also helps to circulate and keep the room nice but like you said body temperature what you use sleep socks talk about those With the what the sleep socks oh okay and why they're helpful sleep socks. well I just started this technique of wearing socks comfy socks before you go to bed because I came across this study which is in the Journal of Physiological Anthropology and it talked about, I've seen this in Asia, particularly in Korea, with the women all wear socks to bed. Not all of them, but most. But when you wear socks, and I'm going to read this off, the brain interprets feet that are warm as a signal to stay in a state of slumber. People who keep their feet a few degrees warmer than the rest of the body slept much more deeply, got into that REM sleep. So I started that recently, and it was very helpful. Very helpful. Just keep that temperature warmer on the feet. You know, it's you see the brain almost like reflexology. I mean, you know, yeah. 7,000 you know, nerve endings down there and they're all happy. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so your central nervous system's like, oh, this is nice. Yeah, I'm so, going to relax. So give that a try. Put some comfy socks on and go to bed with comfy socks. Some people already do it, but you know, for many of us, we don't. A good air filter. If you have a, you know, if the air room Air filtration, needs. clean air, clean up the dust, things like that, pollutants. Beautiful dust. decor. Um, yeah. essential oils, a diffuser sometimes, like I like a lavender eye pillow and sometimes I don't actually put it over my eyes, I just like to sleep with it next to my nose and that's relaxing much more than I had anticipated. I find also journaling. Yes. You know, you're quite often, we're busy people these days, we've got so much on our mind and so much information coming our ways that we have a lot of worries and particularly in these to this day and age, people are worrying about a lot of different things. That uh, having a journal where you write down your worries and get them out of your mind and put them aside can be extremely helpful. Thank you, Frank. There's a good quote by Deepak Chopra, the spiritualist meditator, and it said that your immune system is always eavesdropping on your thoughts. Your immune system is always eavesdropping on your thoughts. So if you can, and this goes not just for sleeping, right? Your language, you know, yes, absolutely. I mean, I've gotten a little irritable at times and was ready to write off a note to somebody. It could be a text or something like that. I just wrote it down. I got in the habit of writing it down in a letter form and putting it in a 
draw for a day. Some people burn them as well to transmute that. Well, I come back and read it the next day and say, I'm <laughs> glad I didn't send this. My God, I'd really be very careful about that. But transferring your worries onto a journal before you go to sleep can be very, very beneficial. Get them out of you. Get them rid of them. Get it down on That's paper. Right. And then gratitude journal we talked about too is just offering thanks for everything that you've had and it just makes you feel abundant and you feel safe and calm. Yes. For anything. I remember Oprah actually had a list and it was a 10 minute gratitude walk where you could journal. And it was to the point where I was walking and I didn't, I ran out of things, even though there are endless amounts of things. And it came down to your shoelaces on your walking shoes. Like you, there's just endless amounts yeah, to be grateful for. Yeah, that gratitude could be a prayer. I mean, a simple could, prayer. A simple prayer. It's true. Of gratitude, of thankfulness to God or to whatever God you have or to spiritually. It could be uh, very meaningful. You know, what we're talking about is pr this transition time frame, a couple hours before, before you bed. go to sleep. Preparing yourself using all these simple techniques that are all doable and are cost-free. Yes, and creating that ritual to honor your sleep, to prepare yourself to actually consciously go into your sleep. We talked about that To whole prepare thing. that, the fulfillment of that one-third of your lifetime. That's right, you're going to make it good. Which if... affects the other two-thirds. <laughs> so, so important. Another thing that I found in the studies was taking a warm bath or shower about one to two hours, for about 10 minutes, that's all, about 10 minutes, one to two hours before bed. And uh, this was in the Sleep Medicine Review. For those who took that 10 minutes, one to two hours before bed, they fell asleep 36% faster, which is huge. And why is that? You take a hot shower, it drives, it, it pulls all the heat out of your core to the surface of your skin in an attempt to cool down. And here's what that means to your brain. It lowers your internal temperature to levels that mimic what you experience during a state of deep sleep, making it easier to doze off. So I started that too. Besides the comfy socks, besides just you know a calming down period, take a hot bath or a hot shower, things like that. And it's been very effective. Actually, it's a very noticeable improvement just on those two things. Socks and shower. It's shower. amazing. It's yeah. so amazing. Also, just energetically, if you're doing any energy work, when I take the hot shower, you can also think of it as an energy cleanse. So it kind of washes away also the day and anything you might have collected in your field, electromagnetic Yeah, release. now what about food and alcohol? Oh, that's huge. I think that's a really common thing that most of us are aware of, is that if you drink too much before bed, and I don't mean just alcohol, then you're up at night going to the bathroom. Right. It's very disturbing to your sleep phases. Yeah, and for some people, they feel alcohol can relax, relax them, them, this and that. But it can too much impair your sleep. It may help you to fall asleep, but it's not a deep, restful sleep. Yes. Okay, it's a disrupted sleep in a way. So be cautious of that. Don't eat too much food before you go to bed because then all the enzymes, all your blood flow is going down to this digestive process, which is, you know, you want to eat a few hours before you go to bed and maybe have a light snack like the banana, which we talked about before. So you know also about um, that, that the hour, those hours that we're sleeping in the morning, in Chinese medicine, the liver is the active organ at night. So if it's trying to process all of those things that has to be cleansed, then your liver is going to be very active because as opposed we, to Because remember restful. we talked about those 100 trillion cells? Yes, yes, yes. We, they're ready to take a nap and say, okay, I've worked for you all day, all evening. Give me a break. I don't want to work all night having to digest this food and alcohol late at night. So be conscious of that. That can really affect your sleeping. Another thing, another technique is self-hypnosis. And so this comes from the Journal of Sleep. You can use different visual visualizations, but they use visualization of picture a fish going deep, deep, deep down into the waters. Just follow that fish. Keep them going deeper and deeper and deeper. And they found that this increases slow wave sleep, which is your body's deepest, most restful stage. If you could just visualize that self-hypnosis technique. I mean, I'm sure there are many, but that's just one. Well, counting sheep is age old. Everyone, I mean, I never actually tried, I had actually tried to count sheep after the show, but just that's hypnotic sort of rhythmic thing. And there is also plenty available on YouTube. You can get your headphones on, even though we're trying to discourage like blue light and electronic devices. 
yes. sound is can then and, and certain frequencies can also put your brain into the alpha state because and then all that deeper blue down. light depletes melatonin, which is hormone secreted from your pineal gland, which promotes sleep, gets us back on the right biological clock. So, what about nutrients? We have many, and like you said, with the banana, that's let's start with food. Let's start that with just Nancy a few. That was Nancy Reagan's favorite sleep aid, a half a banana, because it has natural tryptophan, which is an amino acid protein, which relaxes, increases serotonin. It also has melatonin, so try that technique sometimes. It can help. A banana for me, comfy socks, take my little hot shower, declutter my room. You can have warm milk and honey, because that yeah. also helps you. Warm milk and honey, it raises your tryptophan again, this amino acid protein that is so successful in helping us relax. And of course, there are certain nutrients that magnesium, I used to say after diamonds, magnesium is a girl's best friend. <laughs> it's so true. A lot of women are taking the, the magnesium supplement Calm. Yes. That's it a really good market. It muscles yes. and things like that. There's another supplement that I love called GABA, G-A-B-A, or gamma aminobutyric acid, which is a neurotransmitter that relaxes your brain. It takes stress out of your brain. It's almost like sealing your brain from stress, and I've used it with countless people, gamma aminobutyric acid, so combining that with magnesium is perfectly fine. Another technique is, of course, melatonin, which everyone, most people by now know it. Even pediatricians are using it on children and things like that, so it can be very effective. And as we've said in other, many of our other shows, Marlisa, melatonin is not just simply a sleep aid, but it is a powerful antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, it's anti-cancer, anti-tumor, and so it's really a remarkable uh, nutrient. It's not for everyone, but uh, it can be very helpful if you're having sleep problems and don't want to go to the drug world of the Ambium and Lunesta and things like that. That's right. <clears throat> Absolutely. And lettuce. You had talked about lettuce, <clears throat> and I didn't know. This is pretty amazing that I lettuce came, has some nutrients. I love it, too, before... At dinner, I came so. across a study that showed lettuce. Have a salad with lots of lettuce, or you can even have lettuce, lettuce juice, uh, because there's like an opiate substance that can really relax the mind. I never knew that. Me either, until the show. It. I mean, I don't <laughs> know how really much fun. lettuce you have to eat or anything like that. But even just the anchor of knowing that lettuce, when you're eating it, could help you sleep, will help you sleep, because you're feeling supported. And I think that's just so important that you feel supported in the actions that you take and just knowing the benefits can help you sleep better. So Marlisa, as we wind down this snow, this show, I was going to say snow, it can snow. But what about essential oils? We'll finish on essential oils. Essential like, oils, uh, uh, lavender, lavender is a chamomile um, tea. I forgot yeah, to mention chamomile tea, tea. Lavender, things like that. I mean, I, frankincense relaxes me. Um, but you know what? We really, one thing we wanted to mention that we haven't mentioned yet, and Frank, we do have a slide for that is, what happens if you do all of this and you're lying awake and you still can't sleep, right? What do you do? So the best thing to do is to actually get out of bed. If it's more than 20 minutes, as the slide says, get up and do something relaxing until you feel sleepy because your brain is already hyped up on anxiousness of not sleeping. So you want to just remove yourself from that situation and bring everything down a little bit. Yeah, that's a great idea. And go right back into, okay, I'm in bed now, I feel better, that's over with, let's try and it again. And it might be whatever's bothering you and keeping you from sleeping is to hit the journal too. Oh, that's anything, that anything. You, that's perfect. Yeah. That's right. So anyway, here, our show was to give you and share with you a few tips and techniques that might help you improve your sleep habits. Again, it's one third of our lives. It affects the other two thirds dramatically. And uh, hopefully you've learned a few lessons. I know doing this show, I've learned a few that have helped me. Marlisa? Uh. Me too. <laughs> no, seriously, just thinking about it. I hope you all sleep well. Yes, to good sleep to all of you, and thank you very much. Thanks so much. And thank you, Frank, and SEC TV, and the other Frank, and um, yeah, viewers. Yeah, thank you very yeah. much. Thank you.